This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I'm so glad you're joining us today. I've got our good buddy, our good friend, one of the best writers around uh, coming on the show today. Uh, it's uh, Bruce Cameron, the uh, number one New York Times bestselling author and screenwriter and a man of many, many hats when it comes to uh, putting out great stuff. So we're excited to have Bruce back on the show, and we're going to talk to him about his uh, latest book, A Dog's Courage, as well as some of the other things he's got coming out. So it's going to be fun and exciting and always entertaining to talk to Bruce. So everybody uh, hang tight. We'll come back right after this commercial break. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Hey everybody, this is Tim Link, the host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Got some exciting news for you here today. My audiobook is now available. Wagging Tells, Every Animal Has a Tell is now available in audiobook form through audible.com, amazon.com, and iTunes. It's a collection of 32 conversations I've had with the animals. It's a fun, interesting, heartfelt book that's suitable for all age groups. So everybody pick up a copy of the audiobook, Wagging Tells, Every Animal Has a Tell. You'll be glad you did. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Joining me now is the number one New York Times bestselling author, our good friend of the show. Uh, it's Bruce Cameron. Bruce, welcome back on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Tim. It's always fun to, to have a chat with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're always excited to have you on. Love talking to you. And, uh, I put my roller skates on or my roller blades, whatever's popular nowadays, to keep up with you. Because I, I know there's – if I ask you what have you been up to, then we're going to have to extend the show an extra half an hour because there's, there's too much going on. <laughs> but we'll start off, first of all, talking about the latest, the latest book out called A Dog's Courage. And this is part of the uh, Dog's Way Home novel series. Tell us a little bit about Dog's Courage. Yeah, you know, if you remember A Dog's Way Home, there was this wonderful dog, Bella. We actually went ahead and made a movie out of A Dog's Way Home, and Bella was played by a dog named Shelby. Finds her way onto the cover of A Dog's Courage, which is apt because we are continuing the story of Bella. Now, what has happened is it's been a few years. Lucas, who we met early on in A Dog's Way Home, is married and living with Olivia, who we also met in the same novel and the same movie. And Lucas is a resident, so he's finished med school. Life has moved ahead a few spaces on the board. Uh, Of course, Bella doesn't really know any of this. What Bella knows is they're camping in the Rocky Mountains, and she's having a great time. And then she smells smoke. And that is the signal to everybody that we're about to embark on kind of a white-knuckled ride, because this is probably the most adventuresome book I've ever written. It has a lot of tension as a fire comes and it separates Bella from Lucas and Olivia. Bella once again wants to find her way back to her people, but along the way, this is a huge fire. It has disrupted the ecosystem. It's got animals on the move. You know, when, when the animals are fleeing a fire, a territorial animal's predators become uh, very tense and irrational. They don't behave like they normally do. So there's a lot going on for Bella, who then, as probably anyone who saw the movie or read the first book, would not be surprised. We run into Big Kitten again. Big Kitten was the cougar cub that Bella rescued in A Dog's Way Home. So lots of stuff going on, lots of reunions throughout the book. People who read the first book will say A Dog's Courage definitely delivers on the sequel premise of catching up to some characters and finding out what's going on with them. That's great. Yeah. And I was going to say, you know, when I first heard about the book and then got a copy of the book, I'm like, okay, there's Bella and where's big kitten. I, I knew you, you, you could not, no matter how you maneuver this book, big kitten would have to show up in some, some way or another. Yeah, that's absolutely right. People would not forgive me if I wrote this book and, and didn't and just ignored big kitten. I could do anything. I had big elephant, you know, <laughs> big wolf. They wouldn't care. They were like, where's big kitten? That's right. So when putting that put together this book, you know, it, it's uh, the sequel to uh, A Dog's Way Home. Did you find it easier to remember the characters and remember the, obviously, you know, it was a book and then a big time movie, but was it easy to remember everybody and where you sort of left it at? Or did you have to go back and rediscover these characters again? I really did need to dig back in because even though they've 
aged a little bit. It's, you know, Lucas and Olivia have evolved. When we met them in uh, Dog's Way Home, Lucas and Olivia met each other and now they're married. So that's a big change. And, uh, but still, they're the same people, so I had to go back and re-familiarize myself with them. Bella was easier because Bella is the voice of a dog's courage as well as a dog's way home. And so I, w- I was accustomed to being with her for 85, 87,000 words in the first novel. So a dog's courage, which is a question of finding that dog again uh, among my dog characters. She's kind of, she's one of my favorites because she's... Bella is so devoted and so determined and so accepting of what happens. You know, dogs are, are that way, but Bella in particular is just like, oh, okay, now there's a fire. Okay, now I'm I'm uh, with Big Kitten again. You know, it's like that just sort of just sort of rolls with it in a way that I find really admirable. Yeah, and I love that, like you said, with with the book, there's a lot of a uh, lot of excitement in there, and there's a lot of uh, drama in the book, and uh, it always makes me, uh, you know, I get tied into the characters as well, and uh, it actually sometimes I had to sit down and set the book aside because I, maybe I'm an old softer, <laughs> getting, getting softer. I know I'm getting softer around the middle parts uh, in my old age, but uh, yeah, you know, it, it gets to the point where it gets pretty, pretty intense and you're, you're pulling for Bella and you're pulling for all this and you've got all this uh, drama going on around. Yeah. I think that I've had more than one person tell me the same thing that they got to a point where they had to put the book down a little bit because they were a little stressed out. I think it's pretty funny. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine as a writer, you obviously want people to connect with the characters in the book, especially you know, the lead character in the book, in this case with Bella. But just the uh, it, how do you balance that intensity of uh, putting together a good background to the book and a, a good finalization to the book, but also trying to make it impactful, but not too impactful? I guess I'm going to have to say I, I kind of don't care if it's too impactful. <laughs> I mean, I think my job, one of my jobs is to entertain. I'm an entertain and information and entertainment. That's my business. And I, so I'm trying, you know, I'm writing about these fires in the Rocky Mountains. I was there last summer when there were fires in the Rocky Mountains. And I'm, I'm informing the public about how dangerous they could be. Because so many people are moving to the Rocky Mountains, and I don't blame them. I used to live up there. But it's, uh, you know, you're taking your life in your hands to the extent that you don't do a really good job of clearing away the trees right around your house and all those precautions you have to take. So there's that. I'm informing, but I'm also, I, my job is to entertain people. And I know that people care about Bella, not just because she's She's a dog, but because she's such a special dog. So when they're reading A Dog's Courage and Bella's life is in, at peril, I think people are going to say this is a this is a fun read. I mean, it's it's exciting, but it's a little scary sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. So good job on that. Big kudos. And of course, I'm sure you get asked this a thousand times, too. So when's the movie coming out? That's the next thing. <laughs> well, you know, uh, so we haven't yet sold it to anybody. Sony did the first one. We haven't even really walked in the door with it because we've got so many other things cooking right now. And we're just trying to line them all up. Plus the fact, let's, let's be honest, really COVID just stopped movie production. I mean, mm-hmm. there were so few projects that were going and those protocols still exist because we're still, you know, it's just like, uh, everybody's in California where the, the lockdown has been eased, but there are still some there are mask mandates and other things going on. And so if you want to make a movie right now, you still have to put your actors in, in quarantine. And that's a tough one, especially if you've got a, an actor who's only going to be on set for two days. So they have to spend 14 days in a hotel room by themselves before they can, they can show up on your movie set. That's really hard. So nobody's making movies normally yet. There are some movies being made, but they're, it's just really hard to get things going. And so we have elected to not be too aggressive trying to sell, them, but rather to wait until uh, the business fully wakes up from its nap. Yeah, and it's real interesting you know, with you saying that, because that's one of the things I was thinking about that 
one of the things that never occurred to me because you hit it spot on is the fact that okay if you have uh, you know your main characters your main stars uh, filming a, a movie then okay you can keep them protected and you know get them tested and, and all of this but you're right I had never even thought about if you have a, a character that's there for you know two days filming still a key character to the whole movie but on the other hand yeah. they got to be locked up in a hotel room for 14 days and and they're not going to be doing that for free uh, <laughs> right it's like you pay me okay well I'll stay at the Four seasons for uh, twelve of those fourteen <laughs> days. That's not a problem. So yeah, it's 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 a whole new ball game. On that same avenue, you know what we're seeing with uh, everything going on with streaming coming on and seeing actually f- films that have been made or were made before COVID hit are now going straight to uh, streaming networks. Yeah, and that has proven to be a profitable outlet for motion picture distribution. So. It really has this accidental experiment has opened up the eyes of a lot of studios to what can be done to make money in the movie business. And I I expect we will continue to see that the business is evolving and changing. And and this is one of the ways is that when and if a dog's courage is made into a movie, it may show up just on streaming or both uh, theater and streaming you know you just don't you just don't know what's going on in the business nobody knows my job is much more simple i don't have to make any of those decisions i'll just write the screenplay and hope that they make the movie yeah there you go i was gonna say it it shouldn't change the way you go about doing everything because it seems like the even the streaming movies are the same length of time uh, give or take a little bit so uh, as a screenwriter you just sit down and do your magic and uh you're ready to go Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, well, we're going to take a quick commercial break, then we'll come back and uh, chat with Bruce Cameron a little bit more about uh, Dog's Courage. And the uh, segue, I opened my mouth. I had You gave me a perfect layup there, Bruce, on all the things that you were doing. And I zoomed past that to start talking about other things. So what we're going to do after this commercial break okay. is come back and talk about all these other projects. And then I want to pick your brain a little bit about how, uh, how you juggle, uh, magic juggling act with all this stuff. So okay. everybody, uh, hang tight. We'll come back right after this commercial break. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There's no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Continue our chat with our good friend Bruce Cameron. Now, Bruce, with uh, before we leave A Dog's Courage and talk about all the other wonderful projects you have going on, when people read this, I know you talked about you want your main goal is to entertain them and inform them also. Are there other aspects or things you're hoping that when they get through reading the book that they walk away with? Well, as always, my focus with A Dog's Courage and any other book that I write about dogs is that I want people to understand that dogs are thinking, feeling sentient beings that we are responsible for. We decided that pretty much alone among all the creatures on this planet, we would make a species that was entirely dependent upon us for its survival. You don't see dogs going back to the wild. You see cats sometimes making the decision that they'd rather live and hunt outdoors and not be with people. But you don't see that happening with dogs. And, you know, for good reason. You picture a pack of dachshunds taking down a wildebeest. I mean, it's just not going to (laughs) happen. So uh, but because of that, because we have done that, we have a responsibility toward them. Bella is a rescue dog, as is the real life actor who played Bella and who is the cover dog for A Dog's Courage, Shelby. We rescued Shelby from a landfill in Tennessee, and she has adapted to her new life very well. In fact, she was here at our house, and we we filmed a Target commercial that's playing in Target stores right now, and Shelby is the star. She's the star of that commercial. 
and she just does that. You see her at Christmas. You always see her in, in uh, commercials where there's a dog running around half the time. It'll be Shelby. It's like, why does everybody in, in America have the same dog? <laughs> that's Shelby. <laughs> so that's what I want. I want. That's what I'm informing people is that we have an obligation to these animals. Let's take good care of them. There you go. And and you never know where the next superstar is going to come from. And it could be just the superstar of your uh, your life and your household or uh, a superstar at uh, every Target store across the nation. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> I know you've been busy as usual. I understand you've been uh, writing a, another book coming out, another series. You're doing youth books. You're, doing, you're in the studio recording. So give us a, a little bit of idea of uh, life and time right now of uh, Bruce Cameron. <laughs> well, yeah, the uh, June 1st publication of Cooper's story, something of a sea change for me in my younger reader books, because most of the time my books, LA story, Bailey story, Molly story, these are all books for like third graders to sixth grade or so. And they all have their roots in the adult books that I base them on. So Ellie's story, as an example, is the story of the police dog who's in a dog's purpose. And if one reads the two books, you'll notice that there's a lot of similarities between a dog's purpose and Ellie's story. That's deliberate. I mean, in, in a dog's purpose, it's a dog who reincarnates. In Ellie's story, it's just a police dog who doesn't have any other lives. And, and there were some other ways in which I, I made it uh, simpler and easier for children. But in the end, it's a pretty good adaptation of a different book. And with Cooper's story and some of the other books I've been writing more recently, like as is this case of Toby's story, they are marginally based on the adult books. Cooper's story. There is a dog named Cooper in A Dog's Promise, but there's a substantial difference. So I'm really proud of Cooper's story, especially with the theme, which is that there's a, a boy who, due to a birth, an accident at birth, is unable to walk. So he's confined to a wheelchair and he is determined that he will train his own service dog rather than get one from a service, rather than get one from an organization that trains wheelchair assist dogs. So he adopts a Malamute puppy and raises it to do some tasks. I talked to several people who have wheelchair dogs, so I know what kind of things the dogs are supposed to help them with mobility. That's what Cooper winds up doing. But Cooper, Cooper's a puppy and thinks his job is to be a puppy, to have fun. And so for to explain to Cooper that he's a working dog takes a lot of, I'm really proud of Cooper's story and it's a great book. The June 1st publication is ahead of the audio book, which you referenced because I read Cooper's story. It's the first read by the author book that I have done, gosh, in, in a long time, many, many years ago, I did How to Remodel a Man. Those are the other two books that I've read. But it starts, it's the start of a new thing. We're gonna start doing that because we've come to realize that books that are read by the author are more valued by consumers, and we want to provide as much value as we can. So it doesn't cost anything extra to have it read by Bruce Cameron, and maybe he's not as good an actor as some of the other people who do the books, <laughs> but uh, we just think it was the way to go. Wow, that's great. And so is it designed more to, if you are like listening to audiobooks, you want to go one route, if you like reading the, if you know, your kids like reading the books, they go another route, or do you find it more of uh, everybody wants both? Well, I think that right now, it's, it's such, that's such a great question, Tim, because I only this year became a consumer of audiobooks. And so now I've got a little bit of expertise on the consumer side. And then I, you know, I did my own reading of it. And what I quickly discovered was that books are written to be read, not written to be listened to. And there's there very often are times in the listening of an audiobook, including the one that I just recorded, where I think a rewrite to make it more friendly to an audio format would have made sense. Right now, though, the ethic is you don't change anything. In fact, I was reading Cooper's story, and like all authors, I rewrite everything. And I was reading Cooper's story, and I came across a couple of places where I wish I had written a sentence differently, and I even changed it in the read, and then the director stopped me and said, no, that's not what it says. I'm like, yeah, but it's better the way I just did it. <laughs> it does, but that doesn't matter. What matters, is the, uh, what matters is the written word. It has to be exact. So your question really, really says to me, you know, I think a, a rewrite would clarify things and make it easier to listen to. But if you do that, then you have to say that this is not an exact 
word for word reading of the book, and that's going to turn some people off. Yeah, I find it to be a little bit different audience at times. You know, I I, I did uh, not at your level, obviously, but I did uh, the audio reading of my first book, Wagging Tales. Even today, you know, when I get the, my uh, royalty checks, which pays for my Starbucks fix, um, <laughs> <laughs> I still see there. It's almost for me, at least, my simple little book. It's almost a fifty-fifty split. You know, people who are are still buying some of the audio books. Some, even though the book's quite old, they're still buying some of the older. Uh, print of the book, which obviously to me leads me to wonder, and I'll ask the pro here, what about video books? Are we seeing any trends toward that to see actually the the author or some celebrity actually do a video reading of the books? I think if anybody (laughs) saw me read a book, they'd say, (laughs) oh, I wish wish I'd gotten the audio only version. (laughs) I (laughs) can't. No, you know, I, uh, so right now, the, where the business is, and I, I think, by the way, that particular kind of innovation would be very interesting. I'm not sure who would want it. Uh, a lot of people like to listen to audiobooks while they're driving or walking or otherwise occupied. And the idea that they would stop and watch it like it's a movie has me a little, little confused as to whether or not I would even want to do something like that. I'd have to even think about it. But certainly, I am... Uh, Let's just say I don't look like George Clooney, and I think that for me to sit there and, and spend eight hours of uh, my face on the video screen, that might very well turn people off on reading <laughs> altogether. It may go the straight to the discount bin. <laughs> it, it would be a real traumatic experience. Yeah. Well, I can see, you know, nowadays, you know, videos obviously are everywhere. Everybody wants to see what's going on, especially with our uh, younger crowd. And uh, perhaps you're right. I, I Maybe not sitting down watching eight hours of, of anybody, uh, even if you're George <laughs> Clooney. But uh, possibly, a, you know, I, this is just me going off on a tangent here, but a membership type thing where each week you get a download of, of one chapter. Of, yeah. uh, of it being read. So pass it by to your guys and gals, and if they accept it, I'll, I'll take 10% off the top. <laughs> <laughs> it's all negotiable. Oh, yeah, uh, goodness. Go. Well, did you enjoy doing getting back in the studio and, uh, and doing the audio readings? Well, I wouldn't say that I did. <laughs> I mean, it's really hard. It has to be perfect. And uh, it's just funny how how many times I will bobble, and it's exhausting. Your concentration is so focused. You're paying attention to every word, and and you know I'm from the Midwest. My enunciation is fairly clear, but it's not perfect. There's some words that I where I will clip off the last letter, like a T will be missing, and I have to go back and pick those up. And have to be careful not to pop my peas, so to speak. And, and I mean, there's just all kinds of things that you have to do. So there's a lot to pay attention to. I will say that what I'm happiest about is that in the end, when it's done, I think it delivers some additional value to people to listen to Cooper's story. And A Dog's Courage audiobook is not read by me, but my, but from now on, they all will be. I'm going to read all of them. Catherine Mashan, my wife, will read the female ones, and uh, and we'll. I think we're going to probably do it as a team. If there's like male dialogue, I'll do that, and she'll do the female. I think it'll work out great. I think it's going to be a great innovation in terms of getting people even a more intimate relationship with the author. And uh, it was just put to me, you know, picture if you could hear a book read by Jack London or F. Scott Fitzgerald or. Harper Lee, if she read To Kill a Mockingbird, how mm-hmm. how great that would be and uh, how we have missed an opportunity all this time that I've been letting other actors read my books. Yeah, absolutely. And that sounds great. You've got an excellent partner, knows what she's doing in many yes. facets, so uh, that helps out a lot, too. And uh, Well, that's great. Uh, well, we're excited about everything you're doing. Obviously, uh, everybody pick up a copy of A Dog's Courage, get the audio books, get uh, Cooper's book. I mean, you, you got it going on, so keep it listed. Bruce, how in the world is everybody going to keep up with what you got going on? <laughs> well, they can go to my website, which is being redone as we speak, and supposedly it's going to be far better. I don't know. Websites don't excite me that much, but it's going to be brucecameron.com, or you can go to adogspurpose.com. And we're active on Facebook. There's a Facebook group dedicated to it. It's the A Dog's Purpose fan page. And that's where things are happening as well. And certainly when we have big news, like a book, you will hear about it probably on Animal Rights with Tim Link. 
There you go. There you go. We will definitely have you back on and keep a track of everything going on. So, hey, Bruce, it's always a pleasure having you on board. We're always excited about all the great things you're doing. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to the next one coming out so we can have you back on uh, Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Yeah, thank you so much, Tim. This is always a pleasure. Well, it's our pleasure. All right, well, we're coming to end the show today. I want to thank everyone for listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. I want to thank the uh, producers and sponsors for making this show possible. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for the show, you can drop us a line at PetLifeRadio.com. And while you're there, check out all the other wonderful shows and hosts. It's a cornucopia of great entertainment. That's at PetLifeRadio.com. So until next time, write a great story about the animals in your life. Put it in a book, a blog, an article. Get it out there. And who knows? You may be the next guest on Animal Rights Pet Life Radio. Have a great day. Let's Talk Pets. Every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.